just comes with it, you know. It comes. It's football. It's a business, and they got their use out of players who did well to get the club in the championship. And maybe it's the right deal for the players to go to another club because the club is kind of starting to move in a different direction. The club accepted a bid from Peter Brough for yourself. Um, can you talk me through that period and everything that went around with the bid? Well, basically, Peter Brough was, at the time, they got a new owner who was pumping a lot of money into Peter Brough. So they, they already had a vision. They knew they were, they was going up and up and keep keep going up. So... I heard I heard the buzz around sort of this Peterborough team that is splashing a lot of money, you know. Um, so the owner was very ambitious. And then Darren Ferguson, I remember being on the phone and he called me and he was like, look, I've been given permission to speak to you. Um, do you want to come down to Peterborough just to have a look if you like it, if you don't? So I, I said to him, no, on the day. I said, nah, I'm not really interested. I'd rather fight for my place. So I gave it that that talk because... I didn't know much about Peterborough at the time, you know, so it was like, nah, I was I was about to go on international duty as well. So for me in my head, I'm thinking, nah, I don't really fancy it. Um, but he was persistent. He kept calling. He literally wouldn't stop, you know, he kept calling. Then he started getting players to call me, players that I knew at Peterborough. <laughs> literally, it was like... Hello, is that Gabs? <laughs> yeah, literally, I ended up blocking McLean, I think it was. <laughs> sort of gave in. Um, I said, uh, I said, because I think... Um, the manager at the time, now, it was like, he, he, he was saying, oh, even like, Sir Alex is getting involved in this because he wants you, do you know what I mean? <laughs> so I'm thinking, wow, like, what's going on? Do you know what I mean? So I don't know if that was sort of something to, to make me kind of want to talk to him. But um, yeah, I said to him, okay, let me go on international duty. And when I come back, I'll have a look sort of thing, you know? But as soon as I got on a plane, the international duty, I'm getting breaking news that I've agreed to sign. <laughs> so it was like, I said, I'll have a look. <laughs> so it was, yeah, it just, from there, that's that's how it all happened. So when you got back from playing for Congo, mm. and you're in international duty, did you report straight back to Peterborough? Were you no. literally then a Peterborough player? I, <laughs> no, I was, to be fair, I was getting communication out there. So once I played a game um, in the hotel, I was getting phone calls and he was saying to me, um, yeah, Peterborough have said, come in first thing. So I actually made my way down there. I made my way when I got back from the airport. I made my way straight to Peterborough and ended up meeting. What did he say to you then <laughs> when you when you first got there? Was it a bit awkward the fact that he'd be so persistent over the summer? Yeah, I mean, like it. I looked like because I had time when you when you're on international duty, you're in a hotel a lot apart from when you're training. Um, so I had time. I started looking up Peterborough. Um, and sort of seeing their highlights, how they play, then I, I thought, yeah, it's not actually that bad, you know, it's, it's actually decent. I mean, like, I want to get games, first of all. So what we agreed first, we'll maybe we'll be alone first, and then, we'll, like, we'll do it permanent in January, as soon as that happens, you know. Uh, so I agreed to go on loan, just in case, you know. But the vision he had, he sort of sold it to me, sold me the project, and I just ended up doing well, and I ended up enjoying it so much. That, yeah, I was like, yeah, let's do it. You sign permanent terms with Peterborough after mm. your initial loan spell. Mm. Um, you, you're, you feel that the club was going forward, that Darren Ferguson had a, a plan to implement to get the squad and the team up to that next level. Yeah, it was it was written like, as in like the plan, he knew where he wanted to go. He was getting all the players to believe in his plan. And literally everyone was going into games, if I'm honest, like I knew we'd win, you know, without sounding arrogant. That year, especially we had, Boyd, we had Mikel Smith, McLean scoring for fun. When you got players that score all the time at them levels, all you got to do is be solid at the back, literally. And then the rest will come. So if you hold a team out for long, it's only a matter of time before one of them scores. So it was going like that the whole season. I just knew we kind of had too much for most teams, you know. And it got to a point where I kind of, I was going into games just believing we was going to win. At Peterborough, things are starting to come together for yourself. I know Darren Ferguson made you club captain. That must have been a huge honour for yourself to be made captain of the club. Yeah, it was massive. I mean, like, I've looked up to a lot of captains in the past. I've learned little bits from this one, from that one. And for me, I can now do things my own way, sort of control the dress from him, be that little middleman between the gaffer and the players, give him ideas, tell him how the players feel, just a lot of responsibility. And I think it's something I was ready for, you know. So once he gave it to me, 
I think I already commanded the the, the respect of the dressing room. And that was just the icing. Now I'm the captain of the football club. It was an honour. Do you think you flourished in that role? Do you think that brought the best out of you, being a good communicator and stuff? Yeah, I, I mean, like, it's never really changed because for me, I'm, I'm vocal, you know, on the pitch. I'm very vocal. Um, I do, like, I play with my heart on my sleeve. So I've always seen myself as sort of a captain, um, whether I've got the armband or not. But it just, I think it just gave me a little bit more uh, to my game just and other teams as well like b being aware of me knowing that I'm the captain of Peter United see when you're a captain mm. are you in charge of liaising with the team for group bonding sessions for nights out yeah. with all the emphasis for organising <laughs> them fall on you yeah literally so it, 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 it is a ball lake you know <laughs> I mean as in it's so everyone comes to you about the fines, about whatever, whatever's really? going on, literally fines if someone's getting fined, oh, how much are you charging it? Blah. So it's just, sometimes you just want to, can I just put my boots on and just at least play football instead of worrying about everything else outside football, you know? But yeah, so the nights, I don't mind organising the night out, so <laughs> I'll, be, I'll be all right with that one. Um, but yeah, so the nights out, the fines, um, what else can I think? If we want to ask the gaffer for anything for a day off, the captain has to go in and so it's it is a lot of responsibility and you you do need to be a like have strong mentality to do it because yeah the gaffer could take it all out on you thinking it's your idea when it's sort of the team and it, is there any been any time as a captain when a player's come to you with a request and even you felt like is this geezer taking the mick <laughs> like he had he had last Tuesday and last Wednesday off. Like I can't, as a captain, ask the gaffer this. Yeah. Is there any been in any of them situations? I mean, yeah, as as a for a day off. I mean, like that was the hardest uh, because it, it may be a week where I sort of try and time it with a week where um, we've had two games. So if we played a Saturday and a Tuesday, and then you think it won't hurt to ask for two days off, you know, instead of the one. Um, so I'll try and squeeze it in then. But when it's a Saturday and a Saturday you think, nah, the one day off is enough, you know, like I can't really go in there. Sometimes I do say, nah, look, it's, it won't make sense because he's going to he's gonna come at me for no reason <laughs> and I'd rather just keep him chilled. But I do, I would hint it. So the way I would work would, I would hint it to him. So I'd say, oh, a couple of lads are tired, you know, like, so in, say, just put it in his head. And so I won't say, oh, can we have the day off? Or I'll, I'll, I'll just say, nah, I think a couple of lads are saying tight hammies, you know, so just throw it in there and then it's up to him. So if a player does get injured, I did tell you, you know, so that's the way I worked it. One of the times that you got a little bit of flack from the manager was mm. for a night out midweek. <laughs> um, was it after a game that you guys went out or something? <laughs> this sort of blown out of proportion a little bit. Yeah, that was, wow. <laughs> so we played, um, we played Palace. Uh, we played Palace at home and uh, yeah, Zaha and uh, Balassi literally ripped us apart <laughs> that day, literally. <laughs> they would look like world beaters that day, you know. So they were they, quite young as well at this point, weren't it they? It was ridiculous. I mean, they it was at home, we lost 3-1. Um, I, I, I don't even know what happened. Was I coming back from injury? I don't know how I was on the bench or not even in the squad, one, something like that. Um, so I was on my way back to fitness and I watched this game and yeah, we got battered, you know, like literally it was, it was embarrassing really. Um, and it probably weren't the best idea to go out that night, but I knew we had no game coming up. So it was, I think y Yannick stayed down because um, I know him, for, we're both Congolese and we're family friends as well. So Yannick stayed down in Peterborough um, and I went out with him because he was with me. So we went out for a drink, you know? Um, and then we met a um, couple of the other Peterborough boys. Uh, that also got done, <laughs> so we was uh, we was all there. No problem. Like it was no problem, you know. And then um, I went home. I probably went home about I'd say two. I probably went home about two, yeah. you know, about two I'd say. And then basically, I think there was an incident after I'd left. Uh, so there was an incident that happened um, involving a couple of the other players that were there. So I wasn't part of the incident, but. I think fans, because they've seen me around as well, and we'd lost that day, you know what it's like when the team loses, everyone's angry, basically, you know? So they're taking it way out of context. There was a lot of players, a lot of players there, and it was just, it was, it was a nothing situation, really. It was a nothing situation. I mean, I got in, I got in at probably about two, I'd say, maybe. Um, but we had no training the next day. 
So for me, I'm I'm a grown man. I'm thinking I'm a grown man. I went out with my mate. We got no game in midweek. It's cool. Like it's not a big deal. And then we ended up um, turning up on the Monday. I remember this is like it was it was it was quite strange because I remember it on the Monday. Um, so I walked past like I I parked my car. <laughs> so I parked my car in the car park, and the gaffer was right there. So but I I've got oh you're at gaffer but. All, and he didn't say anything. Literally just stared at me and didn't say anything. And then, and then I've gone into change room and gone to the lads. What's wrong with me? <laughs> like not knowing what's going on. You know? So I've gone, right, it's a bad mood today. Like, I'm, And then I hear, oh, there's a meeting upstairs. Everyone at the club, every single person. I mean, like every staff member, you well, like, Even like the kit man. Everyone. Everyone was up there. Wow. And then I'm thinking, oh my God, like what's going on? Like, obviously I'm not aware of, if there was an incident. How was bad it? was your night out? I I, I'm you, picturing yeah. you bare-chested <laughs> running around the town or something. <laughs> How much carnage did you cause, like? This is it. So, you know, when obviously, I don't know if people are overhearing conversations and putting out content. I don't right. know what was going... Like, at this time, I'm thinking, did I say something? Like, I'm yeah. actually questioning myself. Yeah. And I'm thinking, is it because they saw me with Yannick and, it, like, this is Balassi and we just play Palace, maybe they think, I, d I don't know, like, they're, yeah. they're not happy about that. Is that the problem? All but kinds of thoughts running through literally, your mind. Literally, so I'm thinking something's going on. Yeah. And then he's put us upstairs and he's gone, um, there's four players um, that was out on Saturday and they'll never play for this club again. He's gone, and he's gone, our captain. That he's, he's, and then he's pulled me out. Really? So me and him now having a back and forth in front of the whole club, like, literally... The, the director for this Black Friday, I, I don't even know if the CEO is there. So now I'm giving it back because I'm saying like, we're talking about that. Like, I went out, yeah, I went out, but I didn't cause no trouble. So I'm defending myself. We're, we're going back and forth. I'm saying, I don't know if there was an incident, but I weren't involved in it. Check the CCTV, I'm, like, I'm giving it to him. You know, like, obviously there's words that were, <laughs> like I said it in different ways, but it was that I got mad. Like I got mad, he's getting angry. So I'm defending us, saying, no, we didn't do anything. We went out. It's like, we're allowed to go out. There's no law against going out, you know? So I'm defending it. And then he's gone, oh, you stripped as a cat. Whatever, he's, he's going mad. Um, anyway, he's gone to me first. He's, he's tried to batter me. And I think it's something he does anyway, like a, a thing where, because I'm a big, a big name at Peterborough, I think if he's battering me, the, the youth team players will gain that respect for it. Do you know what I mean? So yeah. I get it, what he does, which makes sense, but I thought he was wrong in this situation, you know? Um, yeah, so I defended myself fully, but I got suspended and with three other dads. But there was a few other lads, which we don't, we don't want <laughs> to name, but we didn't bring them into it. But there was, there was a lot of people out. Do you know what in mean? other words, you took one for the team that day. <laughs> literally, literally, there was a lot more other players and involved. I'm taking that to the grave, you know? Because <laughs> I can't really... Like, I'm not going to stick anyone in it. But as a captain, I felt like I need to protect my players. It's, you redoubled your efforts after mm. that. Mm. You seem to have got back in favour with him, back in the side. Was it a hard thing to, to get yourself back in? It, it was, it was kind of sad in a way because we got on so well. Uh, we got on so well, he's made me captain. And it was obvious. Like, at the time that I got back in, it was just obvious that the team was missing me at the time, you know, without sounding... Uh, bigger than anyone but at the time they needed leadership they needed experience they needed someone you know and at the time I just thought come on you got it. there was games before that I was thinking I'm ready like just like let's put it to bed now let's just it's business let's let's get back into it let's let's um just make up and forget it happened and get on with it so the club sort of put a statement out to say I was no longer suspended um they would now redo everything they don't, they don't want no no issue with me and them it's all resolved i wasn't as involved as they thought previously so i'll take that as an apology um and then i was happy to move on and then once i got back in the team i, I stayed in the team what happened at the start of the next season did you guys did you feel that the squad went backwards in terms of players leaving the club do you feel that the club had sort of had it he had its best peak under Darren Ferguson? I mean, like, yeah, it was um, it was a strange one because I felt that, yeah, it had this peak at the time and maybe it, they people may have seen it as it's, it's going a bit stale, you know? Uh, we've done very well. We've probably overachieved 
for a very long time. And a lot of people were saying that I think things might need a change at the minute. And maybe he needed to go somewhere else as well to fulfill his dreams, you know. So he, I think he'd done an unbelievable job during that period. Um, it was like, it was unbelievable. He had double promotions. That it's nothing Peterborough are used to. So for him, maybe to test himself somewhere else, it may have been the right time. Um, so, yeah, I do think we slightly, we had to go backwards to go forwards again, you know. So I think people needed to test themselves at higher levels. There's players that left. Um, and that was probably it. I think it was just a transition for people. When the club suffered relegation, mm. they offered yourself a new three-year contract. Mm. Did you feel that your career was at a crossroads at that point? Should you re-sign with Peterborough? Mm. So a club you've got a huge affiliation with, or did you did you have cast your mind to to sort of greener pastures, so to speak? Yeah, I mean, obviously we did, we'd um, we'd gone down, uh, and then there's there's a three-year contract on the table, um, but th yeah, the contract wasn't the same. <laughs> it wasn't the same, you know. I mean, like it, there was a lot of things in the contract which I couldn't agree with because obviously I've got children, I've got people to think of. Um, and yeah, the contract was just not suitable for me, you know. So for me, if, I felt like I had to look at my options. Um, and that, that was it. It weren't, a hard, it weren't no hard feelings. And I know it was always been put out there, oh, I, I handed in a transfer request, which I didn't do because it's, it's policy for Peterborough when you've got a year, con or year left on your contract that you will be transfer listed. So that's the policy, but it was put out there. Oh, he's handed in a transfer request. He's done. It. I never did any of that. I mean, I wanted to play, to play for Peterborough, but at the same time, I've got to think about my family and other things because th they're they're why I do it. Now, one move in your career, looking at like I always thought it was right out of left field, is then to transfer to Colony in the Greek <laughs> Super League. Yeah. Such a such a random thing. <laughs> for you to have done at the time. Mm. I don't know what your mindset was mm. looking at the move and the reason for that. Can you can you explain to us a little bit about that decision? I'm, like I said earlier, I feel like I, I was going stale. I was too comfortable at Peterborough, way too comfortable. Everyone knew me. I was the go-to guy. Like, I, I, I walk in the street. No one was even surprised anymore when they see me in the street. It was like, oh, there's Gabs again. <laughs> you know, it was like, I literally was part of the furniture now, you know, so... It was um it was a time where I feel I needed to be fresh again. You know, I needed a new challenge, something totally different. Test myself in the Super League. So I wanted to play clubs like Olympiakos, Panathinaikos, clubs that I see in the Champions League. So for me to get involved in that kind of, it was attractive. What was it like out there? What was the level like? What was the training like? How did you how did you find it initially? To be honest with you, it was very technical. I'd say um, the players. There's a lot of Brazilians and things like that people really? a lot of people coming to sort of the end of their career there's a lot of luxury sort of players um players that don't, will never track back to win the ball back no chance <laughs> <laughs> and it's, yeah it's, it was that double work for me most times because yeah. some people just don't want to defend and out there I just found yeah there was they had a lot of quality but a lot of people don't want to graft you know that that's why I felt very important to Colony because I was prepared to put in the graft and they found me, like, they really, really took to me straight away. And they found, the league found me too physical. I was suspended within four games. It was, <laughs> it was like, so there was actually a lot of stuff that um, I learned just from being out in Greece and I loved it. I find when players that have played a lot in the Premier League mm -hmm. or the Championship move to either Turkey or Greece, mm -hmm. there's always bizarre chairman involved. There's always <laughs> random stuff going on. Have you had any strange experiences in the Greek Super League yourself? It was, it was, yeah. The, basically, my um, when I went to sign, uh, I remember the chairman. We're not agreeing on a contract, and I knew about Greece's financial situation in Greece, so I wanted like a lot of the money up front, you know, just to to guarantee the move. So I, w I was in the office. I'm like, look, I want half up front at least, you know, just because I know, I know players out here that ain't been paid for months. So, yeah, there was that going on. So he's going back and forth with the agent. They're, they're going mad. And then he wants to talk to me, wants the agents to get out of the room. And then he got up. I remember him getting up. And I don't know what he had behind him, but all his staff just stopped him. <laughs> so I don't know if he was, was going to get something out. I remember that. So when I saw that, I thought, nah, let me, I'm going, you know, because if they're not coming up with the money, like, it ain't happening. Because it was a very good contract, to be fair. You know, it was a very good contract. 
uh, and it was sort of a like one. It was life changing as well because it was it was a big club in that, at that time. So I I left. I was on my way to the airport, and I've got the chairman like tailing me behind, <laughs> like in his car, literally chasing me all the way to the airport. And then he said, okay, we'll give you half. You know, so he agreed, but literally followed it all the way from there. So it was it was unbelievable. Like, I couldn't believe even what was happening. So he's walking around with his bodyguards and they've, they've agreed the deal in the end. After a successful season out in Greece, you decided to return back to the UK. Was Peterborough your obvious destination? I said about, about Greece uh, in early statements, I've said their financial situation is not secure. You know, I feel like I went there I got what I could out of it. I enjoyed it. I did enjoy it. It was good. It was a new experience. I scored goals. It was, it was good. You know, I I got in their their team team of the season as well, out there. So, it was nice. But I mean, there was my eye was always on heading back to England. You know, I sort of I missed England after that. And as soon as I was available, they, they I had a two year two year deal um, on the table for for Coloni. But I wanted to get back to England. I said, look, I've had enough. I, I just want to get back, see my family and just see what happens in England. And Peterborough, once they showed um, interest, they were they were ahead in the race already. Just because of the love and the affiliation you've got with the club, the area, the fans, you really you really do love Peterborough, don't you? <laughs> yeah, actually, I love that club. <laughs> yeah. I mean, like, they they just made me feel like like at home, you know, I, whenever, whenever Peterborough feels like my home in England, you know, and that gave me just, it, they were first choice. As soon as I come back from, from Greece, if Peterborough came in, that was it, you know, and it, it was a deal done very quick. We didn't need an agent. It was, you know, I agreed, they agreed. We signed a contract and we got on with it. How would you say, how would you put into words this stint at Peterborough, how did it go for you this time around? I think they, they got the same. Like, I mean, like, they for me personally, they got the same um, the same gaps, you know. I, I put my body on the line. I loved the club. I interacted with the fans. I sold shirts, you know. They, I, I was sort of their their guy, you know. They, they, when you think of Peterborough, this period, I think you think of me. Maybe the success weren't the same, as in we were stuck in League One. Uh, we weren't really flirting as much with the playoffs or, or the top. But, like, for me, I think it was still successful. I was still playing well, and I enjoyed it. Talk to me about the decision to sign for Northampton Town, bringing to a close your <laughs> yeah. your sort of era at, mm. at Peterborough, if you like. Yeah, I'd done my two years. I, as, when I came back, I had a two-year contract. Um, I was always one of the big hitters at Peterborough. And I think the fact that we wasn't in the championship uh, or challenging, really, like threatening to go up was sort of the move we had to take. I felt that they needed to shift me to to sort of make way for certain people, uh, maybe on less money, maybe, I don't know. Uh, but it's sort of the, we was never going to agree a, con a new contract. And I was fine with it. To be fair, I came back, done well, and I was happy to, to go somewhere else. And Northampton uh, came in. And it didn't sit down. It didn't go well with a lot of the Peterborough fans because that's their main rivals. Wow! <laughs> so the, uh, I went to the main rivals, but I had children in school in Peterborough, and for me that was a half an hour journey. So logistically, want. Northampton as a club made a lot of sense for yourself, regardless of rivalries and traditions. Yeah, that's what that that move was simply for that. Um, it was slim, simply as in like, look, it makes sense. I don't want to uproot my kids again. It's just, it's too much. I've just, I've taken them to Greece. And now, I'm, do you know what I mean? It's it's just, just to chill for a little bit, get some sort of, to settle down. So uh, yeah, I couldn't, um, I couldn't turn it down. I mean, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it at Northampton a lot. Um, my time there, the fans liked me. So it was, it was a bit strange to be liked by both sets of rivals, you know, <laughs> which was strange. Yeah, I think it's good for some Peterborough fans to hear what the reason is for you signing for Northampton. Because no one ever thinks, oh, it's because of his kids. They think, oh, yeah. he signed for the club's rival. Do you know what I mean? It's uh, it's good to hear logic and reason behind the move. Yeah, it was, I mean, I've got everything you can think of, you know. The whole, I'm a traitor or this or, you know. Really? There was, there was, there was a few. There was a lot that, that used common sense, you know. Some that used common sense and said, look, it probably makes sense because he lives in the area. So... It, it's probably easier for him and his family. But 
yeah, I got I got the 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 Twitter warriors on me as well at the time. Um, but and as soon as as soon as they realised that what it was, I think in the end, people kind of eased off. I, I remember going back to Peterborough with Northampton and getting clapped off, you know, by the Peterborough fans, which is is something that never happens, you know. So and the Northampton fans really liked me. They had songs for me. So no one re- in the end, I was liked by both. Um, so so now to be fair, I've got like love for them as well. Probably quite a unique thing to be liked by both sets of rival fans. It is like, I think, I always get told it's rare, you know? Very rare. Yeah, it's very, very rare. So I went there, I, I gave, the same I gave to Peterborough, I gave to Northampton, you know, I gave everything. And they saw that and they appreciated that. Uh, Peterborough know what I give to them. So for me, if I'm playing, I'm putting my heart and soul into your club, like you've got to appreciate it. And that's that's the way I kind of take it. Now, Northampton offered you a new, di- new deal to sign. Mm. You ag- agreed terms with Gillingham. Mm. Talk, talk to me about that period in your life. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I start, this is where about the period of my life starts becoming controversial you know, <laughs> because I'm getting contract offers now. I mean, yeah, it was, it, was, um, it was a funny one, this one, because I'd gone to the African Nations um, that year. I did well at the African Nations, but got injured. Um, at the African Nations and Northampton weren't too happy when I come back injured. Really? Yeah, they were fuming. So Because they didn't want you to go to the African Nations with Congo, exactly. I'm taking it. Yeah, exactly. So I'd, I'd gone there, come back injured and the, the game that I was in, like, I pulled my hamstring but because I was captain of Congo as well at the time, I carried on. So I carried on playing hobbling and, and we we'd, um, because we'd made all our subs, so they put me on, I could. I literally couldn't run, but I was hopping on one leg, but they put me up front <laughs> to, to just win flick-ons or whatever. So it was, so Northampton could obviously see this. I bet they weren't best pleased. It, it, they couldn't have been, but I, I understand for them, they're looking at it from their side. I'm looking at it as I want my country to do well, you know, so. And there's no more subs. <laughs> yeah, there's no, so I've got, and I'm the captain. So I've got to stand up and be counted, you know, and for me, for, to my country, I'm a hero. But to them, it's like, you're stupid, basically, you know? So you got to look at both sides. And for me, I did the right thing for myself and my country. So you decided not to re-sign with Northampton. Mm. You then signed a contract with Gillingham. Mm. Is Gillingham far from Northampton? Is it a long distance to rebase yourself? Yeah, this is where I've always had a house in Surrey, you know? So this is where now I'm thinking of the future because I'm thinking, that, okay, I've got a house in Surrey, which is empty. I can move my family into there. And then that's not too far from Gillingham, so I can commute to Gillingham. So I was trying to be to be strate- strategic in the way I thought about this. And look, I weren't going to live in Peterborough forever. You know, it was a place I enjoyed my football, but my whole family's based in London and Surrey. You know, so that's sort of where I'm from. So now I'm thinking about life after football. I may as well get my whole family into the routine now. And it made sense. It was the season ended. I could change the schools round, do it swiftly move into my like my home and do it up as I want it and to just stay there now so wherever I go now this is where I'm staying just to to set my kids up and it just helped that there was three other players from Surrey at Gillingham so we had a car share we drove in once a week perfect <laughs> who was you traveling with I was with Max Amar uh, who was at um, he's at Bristol Rovers now Josh Parker who's at Wickham now and uh Connor Wilkinson who's at Leighton Orient yeah, so it was perfect. Talk to me about Gillingham. No doubt you're a senior pro at this stage of your career. You've got so many league appearances <laughs> under your belt. Are younger players now coming to you for advice? Are you sort of a guy that's helping out other people with contracts and stuff? Yeah, I mean, like, the, it, to be fair, I've always had that um, that kind of role from quite a young age. I mean, at Peterborough, I was, I, I was I had so, ma- so many appearances. People were coming to me for that. But now... I'm captain of most clubs that I go to, you know, so it's now I am the guy to go to and I am the guy that will probably stand up for the youngsters. Um, I you always stood up to uh, for the youngsters, even when the managers were battering them. I would be the one to say, oh, okay, that's enough. Like he'll, he'll learn like from going forward just because when I see their confidence going, you know, and I, I sort of was always that guy that took shots for everyone else. So yeah, there were, when I went drilling, I went with a big reputation I weren't there to make up the numbers. I was. I wanted to be the main man, and that was it. It was. It was sold to me straight away. I went there, did did the business. You like Gillingham as a football club. You like the fans and stuff. Yeah, I enjoy Gillingham. I'll, I'll be honest. I I didn't know too much about Gillingham, so I'll be lying if I said 
like how great I thought it was, but I just didn't know what to expect. But in the end, look, I went there. I did very well the first year. And then the second year, I did well again. And then I got an extra deal. So it was, it was, it was good. Like it worked out very well. They, they, they asked me to come in to stabilize the defense. And yeah, when I left, the defense was in better shape. Put it that way. Now, injuries towards the end of your Gillingham career played a real part in hindering what you were doing with the club. Mm. Probably the first time you've suffered serious mm. concu concurrent injuries mm. throughout your career. How did you deal with that? And especially at the age you're at. Yeah, that that killed me that. You know, I mean, I've had I've had injuries and played on. Like where Peterborough would know me, I've, I've had a broken toe, which I played the whole season with. Um, but this one, because like, it was so awkward. It was, um, I broke my ankle. Uh, so it, there was nothing I can do. You can't actually play through that. I need an operation. Um, it was an awful injury. I mean, like, it was just surreal because I went up with Kiefer Moore in the air. So I've headbutted him, cracked his skull. <laughs> I've landed, like, obviously lost consciousness in the air, landed, had my foot trapped in the ground, and broke my leg, basically, my ankle. So it was, it was just, yeah, ridiculously strange. And one of them ones I don't think I could even do if I tried, if I tried to do it, you know. So, and... Yeah, it sort of impacted me because I was out for a long time, and I never, I never played for Jim again. I, I don't think. No, I, didn't. <laughs> I actually didn't. After that, I never played for them again. So it was very strange. Played just under seventy league games for mm. Gillingham. Do you think it was a bad way for yourself to end your career with Gillingham with such a horrific injury, and then not not having the the option of a redeal? Yeah, I mean, I I still what I looked at is I I still had a year to go. Anyway, so in my head, I was thinking, okay, I can get my rehab done and I'm pretty sure when I'm fit, I'll get back in. But it was just, it was just painful. And at the time, I just, they didn't have the patience uh, to wait because they needed players in, it's people that can play in. And I, I, I would guess I, I'd be taking up a lot of the budget, you know. So as I said, it's business. I needed to get out in their eyes. So we had to sort out, a way for me to get out, which was like to, to sort out a payoff. Payoff and everything sorted out. You then signed a short-term contract with Swindon mm. as well. Are them injuries taking this toll on yourself? When you was at Swindon, did you feel that you'd recovered fully from, from the injuries that you suffered previously? Like I'd say for every game I played, I was fully fit, you know, but it, it was, it's the in-between. The in-between that I had to take into account the, the recovering from the game the pain I had to go through to get to training, to make sure that I'm fit for training. So them sort of things probably took their toll um, in the long run. But as in for the games, there was no game that I thought, oh, I'll struggle to complete this. You know, it was it was that. It was more maintaining uh, the level of fitness that was becoming an issue. After your short spell at Swindon, mm. you then signed for Dagenham Redbridge in January this year. Mm. Um which you made a great start to your club career with Dagenham. Mm. Then the season was cut short due to COVID-19, mm. which so, yeah, is one of the most bizarre things <laughs> um, to live you and going through this while your career's going on and stuff. Can you talk to me about that whole incident? Yeah, I mean, look, it was good. Like, I went to Dagenham. Uh, uh, Daryl McMahon is the manager. I played with him early in my career at Orient. So he signed me and it was just about, I was good in the dressing room. I was a good character to be around the place. And I felt that I brought the best out of a lot of people, you know. Uh, a lot of people had grown up sort of watching me. So now I'm sort of in their dressing room. So I was kind of a big name um, in the dressing room. So I just feel that the whole COVID thing, I think, came just at the wrong time. The whole change, because there's a new manager, everyone was learning. So it kind of slowed things down. And yeah, from then, as you know, everything has just been strange. You decided to announce your retirement from the game in September, mm. quite recently. Mm. Was that forced due to COVID? Do you feel if this hadn't, this incident hadn't have happened, you wouldn't have retired at this point in time? Yeah, hundred percent. I think that had a big, big part to play in it. You know, football at the moment is going in a different direction because of COVID. Uh, there's no fans, and I always feel like I need fans to get going as well to smash a player. I need the fans wanted me to, to to get on it you know so so things like that like I, I kind of feed off it that's my energy my energy comes from you know the, that whole the whole fans and all of that so that killed it and then I mean look there's obviously 
we've heard about the pay cuts in the lower leagues because of, there's no crowd, there's no income. That's another issue. And then another thing that helped me out was that I was started to get all of a sudden a lot of media sort of uh, jobs. So there was a lot of interviews that they wanted me to do, a lot of guest appearances. So I started getting my foot in the door and, and then I started taking interest in it. I thought, okay. So once I got involved in the media and there was now offers for me to, to get contracts and to be signed to, to really big, big companies, I definitely, it was something I had to look into. I'm thinking, okay, I've got a chance to do this while they want me now. Or if I play another year, then they may not want me then or that position may be filled. So I've got to now weigh it up what one works for me. A lot of players, when they retire from the game that they've spent 20 years involved in, suffer from some kind of depression, some kind of anxiety. I'm guessing where you're used to having such a structured environment as well, your whole day or week in some circumstances planned for yourself, mm. it's hard to switch off from that. Do you feel that going straight into the media work, the way you have, has really helped you get on with a real focus and taken your time away from having that, that thinking time to dwell on everything? Yeah, I mean, like, you, you, could, you could say, like, we've always been told what to do what time to be in, what time to... So we know, we, you can kind of plan your week a week before. And going into the media, I think for me, it sort of kept that mentality. It's a different kind of environment, obviously, but it's still in football, so I'm still involved, still get my point across and still use the skills I learned in a changing room or on, in interviews to, to still um, have a good career in the media. So I think it's, it's all played its part um, to keep like sort of my mental state the same, um, which is good because I've got a structured way of living. You've had a fantastic career and a fantastic journey. Have you ever seen the film Groundhog Day where <laughs> the man's forced to live out one day of his life over and over again? <laughs> if I could give you the choice of a Groundhog Day moment mm. from your footballing career, what would that day involve or entail? Uh, the, my day to relive, I think, would be when I was made captain of Congo. I think that was the day that everything set in that everything I'd worked for was now that it was now reality. You know, I had my whole country, a place where I fled from basically because I didn't, we couldn't really be there. Um, and my dad got lucky to get us to a, like a better thing. And now I can give back to them. You know, I, I started like it was it was hundred thousand people in a stadium packed like sardines shouting your name and supporting you and everyone across the country literally there's wars always going in that country but when the football's on it's a party you know because that's all they care about they care about the result if we win the wall comes down you know so it's that that's just how it is in congo and for me when i was made captain i could relive that every single day has there been a decision that you've made in your football career or a decision that you haven't made that has haunted you as time's gone on now, we always look at life as yeah. the grass could always be greener. Has there been a decision that you regret or that you made or didn't made in your footballing career? Yeah, I mean, there's, there's, there's a few moves that I turned down, uh, which maybe looking back, I shouldn't have, you know. Um, I think there was a time when Wigan come in for me and Portsmouth come in for me. And looking back, Portsmouth's massive, you know. Um, so when, when them times, I think I should have, should have pushed that one maybe and, and tested myself. But I was so comfortable and I was happy with where I was uh, when I could have just tested myself a bit more and seen a different, like a big club feel at that level and seen how it was. So that's probably my only regret. The, the other stuff that I've done, a lot of stupid stuff like on social media and things that I, I don't regret any of that because that's just me as a person. You know, I'm, I'm a character and I bring that out in a game. I, everyone knows me as a character. so. It's not something I, I've never regretted being fined by the FA for tweets or nothing. <laughs> you know, that's just me. So so if I abused you in a tweet or said something crazy, that, that's that's just me as a person. Uh, so I, I give and I can take it. So at the same time, if I'm getting fined by the FA, then it is what it is. Some of the best pundits have been more outspoken. Mm. Do you see yourself in that kind of mould as a pundit? Now, I know it's, it's very hard to predict mm. what you're going to say and what you're going to do, but... If you've got something on your mind, will you express it rather than sort of keep it inside? Yeah, yeah. Like uh, basically, I think I'm one. Of, I'm, I'm. You just with me. You just don't know what's gonna come out. You know. <laughs> so, so I think I do keep 
the producers on edge, like because they when it's live, anything can happen, <laughs> you know. So like they said to me, I'm a high risk investment. So it it will be, it will be it because I'm exciting because I will say what what I think. I will I will speak properly also. You know, it's not it's not like I'm not media trained. I am media trained. Um, so I will I will say it in the best way possible, but as honest as possible. And for me, I don't like to be scripted. I like to ha show, let your character show through, be yourself, and that's what I try and be. It's weird because we all want to hear something controversial. Mm -hmm. If you look at Patrick Severo's comments <laughs> regarding uh, David Moyes quite recently on Sky, Sky yeah. had to come out and apologise. But yeah. us as viewers, we was lapping that up. Yeah. We were right into what, what was going on. So as it's sort of good and bad, doesn't it? Yeah, but for me, I'd rather hear honesty, you know? If that's how he feels, he should be allowed to say, you know? So he should be allowed to just say what you think instead of, like, there's nothing worse for me when, when I see scripted yeah. and basic answers that I could have answered, you know? But I just, I'd like people to show what they believe um, and that's it, you know? You know certain people, like we know Sunes, He's not the biggest fan of Pogba, <laughs> but, but he, he makes that very clear, you know, and that's fine. You know, that's his opinion. It's fine. Do you ever see yourself moving into the managerial pyramid? Is that something that you've given any thought to? Um, I've started my coaching badges. I'm on the UEFA level B stage. Um, so I'm pretty high up in the coaching. Um, but the manager things has never really interested me as much. Um, I'd rather talk about the game and do other things. I like even coach kids, inspire kids. I don't, for me, the whole manager thing, I've had the football career, the moving around, I, I feel stable. And for me, I'd, I'd rather perfect what I'm doing right now. Gabs, I've got to say, I've thoroughly enjoyed listening to you talking to your career. It's been great to spend the day with you. Um, I look forward to seeing yourself involved in some big punditry moments. And hopefully we'll be discussing Gabriel Zuccarani's comments of controversial stuff in the future. <laughs> Um, thank you ever so much <laughs> Top for giving thank me you. your time. I appreciate it, mate. <laughs> thank you. Top man. Thank you.